Welcome. I'm Ryan Moon. I'm the Public Policy Manager here at the Greater Morning Partnership, and thank you for joining us today in person and virtually. Uh, in collaboration with the Capital Crossroads and the Young Professionals Connection, we welcome you to today's conversation on infrastructure. For the attendees online, we ask you to place any questions you have into the chat, and we'll be sure to uh, get to those if we have time at the end. For those of you in person, uh, we have a good amount of time at the end, they'll uh, answer all your, your great questions for our, our panel today. Uh, as you can see, our, our panel today, too, we have two individuals uh, in person, and we have uh, Mr. Ashley on, online. At the partnership, uh, we work with the Robert D. Billy Ray Center at Drake University on the Show Some Respect campaign. With that in mind, I would like to take a moment to remind everyone on the importance of civility in today's conversation. Advancing meaningful conversation requires respect. The partnership, we urge all Iowans to engage in active listening and be courteous as they express their opinions on the issues. Together, we can have the tough conversations in a respectful way and find a common ground solution. As an organization, the goal is to educate a broad audience on a variety of topics. So more individuals can understand the topics as they speak with their elected officials and also speak throughout the community. For 2022, we've scheduled six public policy issue forums. Uh, they happen every other month on the third Thursday of the month uh, from noon to one. Uh, this year, we've already covered the topics of immigration, the search for talents, and today we are covering infrastructure. Our next issue forum will be on cybersecurity, and that is on August 18th. So if you haven't registered for that, uh, please do so. We'd love to see you. Each year, the Greater Warrior Partnership, we develop a state and federal policy agenda uh, that we use to advocate on the entire year. The topic of infrastructure continues to be an important issue each year. In 2021, the partnership supported the passage of the Bipartisan Investment and Jobs Act. That legislation serves a major step forward to fulfilling a long overdue commitment to repair and expand our aging infrastructure. Infrastructure investment has constantly been a top priority for the partnership year in and year out. I'm sure everyone up here has constantly heard that term infrastructure for decades. Today, the panel will address how dollars from the bipartisan infrastructure bill will be impacted by supply chain issues, which are all, everyone's been hearing that, inflation, and of course, the word we've all been hearing, talent shortages. I will now turn it over to the experts uh, to better dive into those issues by introducing our moderator, Robert Palmer. Robert Palmer is the General Counsel and Director of Government Affairs for the Iowa Legal Service, where he focuses on legal and legislative challenges that Iowa cities face. Robert graduated from, from Drake University with a degree in law, politics and society in Drake Law School with a specialization in legislative practice. Robert serves on the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago Community and Economic Development Advisory Council. That is, that is long. <laughs> <laughs> is the president of West Des Moines Community Foundation, chair of Drake University College of Art Sciences, National Advisory Council, a member of the Drake Law Recent Alumni Engagement Board, and an appointment, appointee for the Iowa Board of Physical and Occupational Therapy. He is also, no surprise here, the 2019 honoree of the Business Records 40 Under 40. I told you we had experts today, so it's <laughs> great to turn it over to Robert, uh, and the floor is yours. All right, well, thank you very much, Ryan. Ryan told me, I uh, asked how I speak, where's the mic, and he said, act like you're just talking in the back of the room. So really, for those of you who know my normal voice, this is not a problem at all. Thanks for joining us here today to talk about really this incredibly important topic that you know I've been in the public policy sphere for a little over a decade now and infrastructure has always been something at the forefront of public policy discussions and certainly when we look at the needs of this country. What we've always seen is a shortage in workforce uh, and, and certainly in the financial resources available, but now we're seeing those high and also uh, some acute needs that are a little bit different than what we see in the past. So it's a really great time to begin this conversation. As Ryan said, I'm really pleased to have three different experts up here that are coming at this from a variety of perspectives to hopefully have a, a broad and informed discussion. 
I'm going to go through and do some introductions and, and boy, if, if he thought mine was a mouthful, I am going to try and get through all of these, although I'm not sure I'll be able to speak as clearly and concisely as Ryan did, but I will try. I will start. Todd Ackrey, who is joining us virtually today, uh, is the director of the Des Moines Area MPO. He brings two decades of transportation, planning, designing, and programming experience to the greater Des Moines region. His specialties include road design, general aviation master planning, transit planning, bike and pet trails, multimodal studies, planning and programming, and environmental documentation. He understands project management and the importance of bringing diverse interests to the table. Under his guidance, the MPO has strengthened its community partnerships and has worked to provide more support to the communities in this area as well as Iowa as a whole. He's earned his bachelor's degree in urban planning from Iowa State University and a master of public administration from the University of Missouri Columbia. So we will, we will hold the applause until the end for everybody. Uh, Mark Pearson with HNTB he is the Des Moines office leader for all Iowa-based operations and client service. He is a graduate of, graduate of the University of Iowa School of Planning and Public Affairs master's program. His career in transportation infrastructure has focused on environmental analysis, business technology and ITS solutions, and public involvement. Mark's varied project experience includes the Boston Harbor Cleanup Sewer Program, the Iowa DOT's public involvement management app and the Des Moines Southeast Connector Environmental Impact Statement. Chris Sidoris, can I say your last name? Yeah. Perfect, yeah. thank you. With Hubble Realty, serves as the Vice President of Development for Hubble Realty Company, certainly a, a name we see frequently on signs in the Des Moines area. She provides strategic insight and planning for the division and works with developments including multifamily housing, mixed use development, 55 plus housing, assisted living, affordable housing and urban neighborhood development. Hubble Realty currently, this is a pretty astounding figure here, has over 1 million square feet and approximately over 1,000 units under development in Des Moines, as well as Des Moines newest 75 acre urban neighborhood, Gray Station, not too far from here. Prior to joining Hubble Realty in 2011, she spent 26 years with Conlon Properties, which is a leading affordable housing developer in Iowa. And that, in that role, she created almost 50 affordable housing communities. It's pretty astounding. In her free time, I guess you'd say, she serves on the president of the board of directors of Home Inc., a local nonprofit, uh, nonprofit affordable housing developer. She is chair of the Downtown Economic Development Committee and serves on the Midwest Housing Development Fund CDFI board. She is a member of the ULI Iowa, Crew Iowa, and was the National Crew Impact Award nominee. Chris was named in the 2015 People to Watch of 2016 by the Des Moines Register and recognized as a 2016 Citizen of the Year by the Downtown Des Moines Chamber. She also holds a BS and an MBA from Iowa State University. That concludes the toughest part of my day. Now <laughs> uh, we get to go to the, to the really fun part and turn it over to our experts. So I have some prepared questions, but the first thing we're going to do is turn it over to each of you for uh, some brief opening remarks to kind of set the stage. And Todd, we've got you virtually, so I will go ahead and turn it over to you first, uh, and then we'll go from there. Okay, thank you. Um, you know, the infrastructure, is, as was noted in the opening comments, is kind of the backbone of everything that works for the region. And it's been severely underfunded uh, for quite a long time. The Infrastructure Jobs Act provided um, some much needed funding. It didn't go all the way that we would have liked to have seen, but it certainly uh, brought uh, needed funding to, to the uh, region. We're starting to see the programs uh, roll out um, and how those rules are going to be uh, developed. Uh, so it's an exciting time to, to see that funding become available. That's absolutely correct. We'll just kind of go in order of proximity. Mark, we'll sure. go to you next. Sure, thanks, Robert. Yeah, I, I agree with Todd. It's an exciting opportunity. And who knew just when we were going to get started on the infrastructure funding that we needed, that we would get slammed with a pandemic, war in Europe, a bunch of factors that start all of a sudden driving up the cost and start to peel away those dollars before we even get a chance to access them. So there's a variety of challenges that we're facing. Uh, with this infrastructure bill. And, and it's a great start. As Todd noted, there's more that needs to be done. Uh, but boy, it's an exciting opportunity. And if we can get through some of these 
short term hiccups like inflation that we're facing right now, it really sets the stage for, for Des Moines, Iowa, the US to reinvest in the infrastructure that we need. And I think honestly, have neglected over the last 30, 40 years. Exactly. Yeah, and I'll, I'll lean in. I totally agree. You know, it's it was nice to see it finally bubble up. It's something we could talk to. You know, it's the least sexy thing, but one of the most critical things, you know, and I suppose, especially for those of us that work in Des Moines and understand the, that even the infrastructure that we have just in Des Moines and the age of that. And so it's nice to see it brought up. You know, I think I always tell people like, this is a 10 year program. This is not designed to spend, you know, a trillion dollars in the next 60 days. So um, it'll roll out at a good pace. It's necessary. I think it'll it'll bring to light the understanding of the critical nature of all these pieces. So I'm excited to see it come about. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. I like how you described it as not being the sexy thing. I've, I've heard that term before. The truth is that infrastructure, when it's working appropriately, it's something that most people don't think about. But when it goes wrong, as we've seen through a variety of examples, then it's certainly on the forefront of our minds. So we will now jump to our questions that, you know, Ryan wrote here that I printed, which truth is Ryan really did the bulk of the work here together, <laughs> and they are, they are fantastic. So uh, if you have questions, we will do questions in the room later on, but if you are uh, visiting with us virtually here, please share those questions into the chat, and Ryan will be monitoring those, and we'll be able to view them later. I will go ahead and ask the questions. I'll turn it over to one person to start, and then we'll open it up to the entire panel. Uh, for this, I'll, I'll stick with the regular order, and Todd will go to you for the first question and then open it up. What infrastructure projects do you see as having the biggest impact on this region, and how are those projects being impacted by some supply chain issues and talent shortages? Sure, uh, thanks. Uh, there's uh, quite a variety of uh, projects, some some on, on the highway and road side and some, some on our trail side. Um, you know, the Hickman uh, I-35 interchange project uh, is a, a big project that'll uh, hopefully uh, help push traffic through uh, easier uh, along that bottleneck uh, on the uh, west side. Uh, we recently finished the transload facility on the, the east side of the metro, which hopefully will allow for more efficient movement of freight in and out of the region. Uh, a water trails project that we've been involved with for a number of years, um, I think will be a, a real boon for the, the region once once the, the big projects get done. We've seen some of the, the smaller projects get done and, and those have had big impacts already. Uh, supply chain issues are, are kind of a big issue. You know, as everybody's noted, um, steel is hard to get. Rock um, is really hard to get for construction projects. Uh, some of that for DOT projects is, is um, two years out to get rock projects. Uh, obviously, fuel prices um, uh, are going sky high, and, and um, that affects uh, asphalt pavement uh, costs as well. On our transload facility, um, it didn't the pandemic impacted it somewhat in that there was limited places where we could uh, get rail for the transload facility. There's about fifteen thousand feet of, of uh, new rail along that facility. And uh, the plant we were getting it at, there's only a few plants in, in America that we could get the rail from. And the plant we were getting it from burned down right before we got our order. Uh, so we actually had to do some creative things to find some rail um, to, to put that in there, but we got her done. Um, so, you know, supply issues, uh, steel and rock costs are, are just uh, a huge driver of cost increases. And so that impacts what you have available for construction and then a worker shortage in the construction industry in general. To add fire to my list of things impacting infrastructure. I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, any additional comments from the table here? Parker, Chris? I, you know, we were talking about this a little bit beforehand, Robert, and just, you know, when Todd said, there's just been so many different things hitting all at the same time that the folks that we work with in the industry are really having to get creative in the way they procure material, the way they work with their contracting partners to try and get as much flexibility built in uh, as possible. And you know, nobody really knows where things are going. So I think the more that they can cooperate and, and find creative solutions around some of these challenges, the better off they'll be long-term. Mm -hmm. Yeah, same, you know, we, we've been talking in our, bumpy is the word I've used with my team for about a year mm -hmm. now. I'm like, it's gonna be bumpy. And if your expectation is there, you understand that. 
you know, we, we, we still like, you know, we're control freaks in our industry. We like projections, we like numbers, and it's all out the window. And so you just have to understand it's going to be bumpy. There's things that will come up and you just got to roll with it. And so we've been having that conversation for a long time. And same thing, you know, everything that happens right now, we're like, oh, okay, like, that's exactly what happened in 20 years. And it's like, no, you're, we're in uncharted waters. You can't go back and say, okay, we know in two years this will be done. And, and so I think it's how do you kind of balance all of those basic underpinnings that we know are strengths of this region and nationally, it'll be okay. We'll get there, but it's going to be bumpy and it's going to be, you're going to have like, you know, Todd's fire. Okay. Yeah. You know, it is what it is and keep on going. Certainly highlights the need for creativity and flexibility yes. as you move forward. And so clearly for the, the role of consultants and other experts, it really is going to heighten what, what maybe your clients are looking to you for. Uh, we will go in uh, the opposite order, because I'll go with you uh, first on this one. How has inflation, something that we're, we're constantly talking about, and I know that, that the Fed is trying to get under control, how has inflation been impacting current projects, and how do you see that impacting future projects? Well, A, it's crazy, and B, it's crazier right now. I mean, it's, you know, for construction, we were about 20% last year. We're about that level now. Um, you know, I, I wish I could say, like, you know, people say, oh, the Fed moved it yesterday. Okay, yeah, oh, boom, everything pulls back today. It's, it just doesn't happen that way because we're so interrelated. So, uh, you know, I've seen everything through, you know, end of next year, mid next year. And again, the reality is we don't have this like, oh, okay, inflation now, once you move the rate, it comes back here. We really just don't know. And then the problem I think is that you have all these unique things overlapped over, okay, what's a COVID? You know, what's the shutdown in China? What's the, all of those things you talked about all come together and we just don't know because you can't peel those apart. You won't be able to. And so we have obviously seen that impacted a lot. We spend a lot of creativity a lot of, you know, VE time or what we call value engineering. You know, I just, that's where I came from. I was an hour on this, you know, I had a project going up down here in Bridge District. Well, my flooring came in crazy. So now we're literally down to going, okay, I have this little utility closet on here, flooring out. It's all of those creativity things um, that's going to be with us for a while. And so the expectation that, you know, you'll have, the money's just not going to go as far. And I think that's the reality of this infrastructure bill. It's necessary. The reality is the projections when you head back here for what's happened are going to impact those. So um, I think that's going to continue to go on um, for a while. And I, I always tell people, March of 20 is not coming back. It's not. So <laughs> stop waiting for it. <laughs> Marketing projects that, that you guys are working on now, do you see direct impact of inflation or, or the yeah. projections you're doing? Yeah, it, it's happening with all the clients that we work with. You know, it's one day it's a five, what you think is a $5 million project comes in at seven or $8 million. And then you're like, okay, I'm lucky today because I only had one contractor bid on it. I'm going to wait a little bit and then I'm going to relet it and see what happens. Maybe things will calm down and be a little less bumpy, <clears> right? But when you don't have that cushion, again, you're scrambling because the dollars you think you're going to get out of this bill and start to forecast where things are going to go and what you're going to do with that money is suddenly just chewed up by everything we've talked about. And, and the people that we work with, I know Todd probably faces the situation all the time. What you thought you had, you don't have. And now again, you've got to get creative and figure out how am I going to accommodate or stretch things one way or work with a contractor in another way to, to get by until things calm down or pestilence hits. I think that's the next one on the video. <laughs> Let's hope not. No, that, is, that is a great point. You know, we hear about some of the numbers that are included in these bills or even going back to the American Rescue Plan. And the numbers themselves seem very large. But when you look at what things cost in the infrastructure world, and, and even I've been looking at when we get into wastewater treatment plants, some of the valves and things we need have just gone up astronomically. And so that those dollars seem more on paper than they are when you go to make the purchases. Uh, Todd, you had mentioned a couple of really big projects happening here in the Des Moines area that we had somewhat of a cost understanding of a few years ago, but certainly that may be evolving now. Any, any understanding of how inflation has been impacting those, whether it's causing delays or changes? Well, you know, on our, our water trails project, um, Scott Avenue, um, 
And we, we bid that project earlier this year and then the, the bids came back as, as Mark was mentioning on his project came back really high. Um, so we had to kind of retool uh, the bid package. We'll, we'll relet it later this, this year. Um, and some of that's related to inflation. Some of that's materials. Costs have gone up, as, as was mentioned. Um, uh, fuel prices for transporting some of the materials, you know, all those factors. So uh, retooling how some, some of those things and, and looking at how we can value engineer it a little bit uh, to, to bring those, those costs down. So it's certainly impacting that and it's impacted other transportation projects. And, and you know, we, our programs are four to five years out typically. And so those end year projects, you're really taking a look at, you know, is that money really going to be there for those projects and, and um, how, do, how do we best address those, those issues? Um, I'm going to reorder this just slightly because I think one of these questions really follows nicely. And that's generally speaking on the industries you work in, how have supply chain issues really impacted what you're doing today? Mark, we can start with you on this one and go. Yeah, I mean, there's so much related to that, especially on the material side of things. And, and just the uncertainty of if I place the order three months ago, is it going to arrive on time? If I don't have the capacity to store it when I receive it, and I dare, do I dare send it back? Um, will I ever see it again if I do? It, it's, it's just, it just keeps compounding on itself. And so it, you know, we're seeing it reflected, as you mentioned, in, in, the, in the bids that our clients are seeing on their projects. And, and they're, they're gonna have to get creative. And you know, it's clients working with their contract partners to either build in more time in the schedules to allow the contractor to find and source those materials and get them on site when they need them. Or I've even you know, been hearing within the industry that there's talk of starting to let projects before you have permits, before you have everything buttoned up nice and clean, again, to give the contractor that amount of time that they might need to source the materials. So it's, it's again, it's flexibility, it's creativity. Um, and I think in a lot of ways, as we go through this bumpy time, they're kind of making it up as we go. Chris, I'll turn to you because I know in housing, you've got a particular need for increased housing and, and at a price point that can be afforded, but certainly uh, some difficulties in getting those supplies. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, so supply chain is just, again, that predictability. I mean, that's the frustrating, you know, I mean, it's just, it's exactly what Mark said. I mean, you just literally don't know. I mean, the, the flooring that I was just talking about. So, you know, we were ready to go, contract ready to go last December, and they're like, okay, order. And they're like, okay, we're gonna ship it in a week. Okay, I barely have a piece of concrete. Where in the world am I gonna put a five story? And they're like, oh, it'll be there in a week. And it's like, same thing. You're like, whoa, whoa. So we did, we were like, stopped it. But then you're like, and so now we're getting ready. And it's like, okay, I really don't need it till next year, but I gotta have it. So, fortunately, I have a garage that we're gonna figure out how to shut in. But again, you have to be creative. So we're going to take flooring delivery and find a place to put it because it's the only way, A, I can make sure I have price, which is, you know, to control that, but to make sure it's here. Because same thing, you used to be able to, oh, as long as I order six weeks out, it'll be there. I can get it by floor. Yep. All of that's out the window today. And so you literally don't know. Yeah. And so it's this constant dice roll and... We're working on an expansion of our office space, and I, and I encountered this issue firsthand because one day a truck pulled up with all of our furniture that's supposed to be here in three months. <laughs> Where do you want it? Um, well, I can't truck. send it back because we'll never see it again, right? It'll go to the next person in their order. So we had to get creative with the landlord, and they were kind enough to help us find some space and charge us a slight rent on it to be able to store it. But I mean, that's an example. Sometimes it takes months to get it. Other days it shows up when you least expect it, and you just got to be flexible. You got to you got to take the, the happy opportunity <laughs> <I> guess, <laughs> to store it that you have rather than yeah. You know, sometimes it's a happy creative opportunity. Yeah. But sometimes not. So. <laughs> Todd, I saved you for last on this because the MPO works on a wide variety of on what many people would think of as really traditional infrastructure. Right? You get into the wastewater, roads, so you got a lot of the concrete, steel. Uh, as well as many of the other things you mentioned. What are you seeing in the supply chain? Are things coming in? Are projects being paused? A lot of, a lot of the, it's higher prices. Steel is hard, hard to come by, uh, or enough of it anyway. Um, sheet piling uh, for uh, water projects where you're, you're um, draining out 
uh, the areas to coffer dams, that type of thing. That's been tough to get. Rock is um, riprap uh, type rock is really um, difficult to get right now. A lot of DOT projects were let um, and it's sort of taken up the bulk of that for the next year and a half. Uh, so just uh, having enough of that locally or at least close enough by that you know, your transportation costs don't kill you has, has been a challenge. I want to pivot here and talk about the workforce a little bit now. And uh, this is it's certainly something that we're seeing nearly every industry face. But when we think about ramping up some of these infrastructure dollars, we've talked about the difficulty in even getting the supplies and materials, but then getting the workforce that you need to do that. We were kind of talking about this a little before. You can't just take someone and, and have them go build a road. There's specialization there. And so what is the impact, the lack of talent in this industry having, and then what is your organization strategy that many others will probably want to steal to attract that workforce? And Chris, we can start with you and just kind of go around. Yeah, I mean, this is, you know, obviously our industry was short, you know, pre-COVID. And so, you know, our industry was a little bit proactive in that locally we, we batched up um, with the Moines School District and actually put a, you know, a, a program in place um, to do actually at the high school level to start to entice them and do some training at that point. You know, the goal is obviously to get that cost, um, you know, out of there so it's in the high school system and they can come out. Um, you know, I think that's at least some of the early conversation that I'm hearing on this bill is that it has, you know, we have to be thoughtful about how are we starting to bring people into this industry now, but more so give them those skills. So again, you have a 10 year window now, so you can do some of that training. Um, so it's again, attracting that, you know, when we talk about, you know, I, I, the transit facility, one of my favorites, I'll be, I'm excited. I talk about it all the time because again, we know transportation costs are continuing to grow. The amount of truckers that we have is continuing to go down. Their average age is over 50. Again, who's training to be a trucker? Nobody. Okay, so the transload facility takes on an entirely larger role because now you can move it quicker. And so I think understanding how we can go with less people, um, but also how do we bring them in and give them that education that's just to go, okay, tomorrow I need 12 guys can build a bridge. Well, they're just not there today and I, they're not going to be there. So. You know, before all this hit, we were doing a lot of things uh, in the area of STEM, for instance, um, trying to organically grow that pool of resources. Because when the infrastructure bill hit, it was, you know, if the dollars are increasing our client programs, at least in the intent was to increase them by half again or more, we didn't have that pool of talent to tap into to just all of a sudden be able to accommodate all that. So just like there's been inflation in materials and gas and you name it, there's been inflation in the cost of talent. And we're finding, again, this is going to be a theme today. We have to get creative and create opportunities and, and really do things that resonate with the talent that we want to draw uh, to be able to help our clients deliver their programs. So just like they're facing material shortages, we're facing talent shortages. And there's no quick, easy solution. There's not a pool of engineers and planners that you can immediately tap into that you're not taking from somebody else who's trying to also deliver that program. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, that's a great deal. When we think about the supplies we're trying to get into the state of Iowa and the workforce we're trying to get into the state of Iowa, we're in competition, right. not just nationally, but in some cases globally, too. Yeah. And so it's not a, a, an isolated network. It's, it's broad. Todd, what are you seeing in the, the talent attraction space? A lot of similar things to what Chris and Mark have said is um, it's tough finding people and, and uh, offering the right package to, to entice them to, to come into your organization. And, and stay, uh, frankly, though the MPO has been pretty stable as far as employees, but we had a couple openings and um, and in new programs and we, we got two applicants for one position where typically we would have had 10 or 15. Um, so it, it definitely is impacting um, finding people. Uh, my my neighbors uh, uh, works for United Contracting is one of the managers there and, and they can't keep people either. Um, and they, they have, a number of programs that they, they use to help entice people and, and it's just tough finding finding people and then getting them to stay. Um, so, uh, you know, we try to offer different incentives uh, for folks to, to flexible hours and, uh, you know, different uh, perks, but uh, it, it can be challenging to find people that are the right fit. 
I'll open this one up to everybody. Is anybody seeing their this drive more of a desire towards automation or conversations in that area about what processes maybe can be done in other ways, or is that something that we'll maybe have on the horizon? I think you know we're silly not to. I mean, the reality is there's not like there's not like 50 million people over there that just aren't working. Right. You know, I mean, and so it, it, the reality is, if you look at the numbers, you know, and the, as old people are going out and the number of new people coming in, there's not this equal number. And so the reality is, you you can't continue to add jobs when you're not adding people. So you have to think about, it, and that's why I go back to the transit facility. That's why that to me was such a big deal for us. It allows us to move all of those pieces here much easier. If you think about all those pieces that are coming in those rail cars, as opposed to a truck driver on a semi coming from California, coming from the East Coast, you have to think about that. How do you continue? And then that allows us to get things here easier and quicker, as opposed to using, some, you know, because I mean, the trail got the, the one rail car keeps on going. Yeah. In fairness, the, the truck driver has to stop if you want him to stop on the way. And so that's to be a, a really good example of how we start to think about creatively moving freight, moving, and that's a long-term sustainable strategy. You know, us just finding more truck drivers probably isn't the answer because who really wants to drive from here to California twice a week? You don't. So I, I think it's those kind of ideas. We have to get to that point. We don't have, we don't have sustainable. You can't keep doing this. There's not all these people. Yeah, we, I mean, we were basically at full employment before this bill hit. And again, the talent pool didn't increase. Um, on our client side, you know, we're, we're, we've been doing things to help them do more with less for quite a while. Um, you know, their talent pool is shrinking as well over the years and their ability to deliver projects uh, is evolving. So the more that we can do to get creative and help them do things, I'll use the example of public involvement. Um, the Iowa DOT once had six planners assigned one to each of the six districts in state to handle all their public involvement needs. Well, as recently as three months ago, that was down to one individual covering the entire state. She was fortunate to be able to hire a second, so now she's only got half the state. But finding ways to help them do their job more efficiently to focus on, am I reaching out to the right populations and communities? Am I talking to the right people about the project? Am I hearing what they have to say? And, and responding and, and helping communicate and, and get across the expectations and the, and the uh, things that we want to be able to discuss about this project. You know, those kinds of things have been going on for quite a while. It's just been exacerbated by the new infrastructure bill and all these other factors that we've been talking about. Yeah. Uh, I'll open up the opportunity, but if not, I don't want to move on without you. Any thoughts about the increase of automation or whether or not these higher costs or lack of workforce? Yeah, um, it, it certainly, as Chris mentioned and, and Mark, it, it, we need to find innovative processes to do that. And, and one of the things we did, um, just as a small example, is you know we have a, a, a 600, 700 plus miles of trails. And so to manage that, people are having to go out and, and visibly inspect all that. We developed a bike. Uh, that we can take across the the trails to, to to see how the main the pavement is doing, and take pictures of it. So the the staff uh, can then do a desk review of the pavement and and understand what the conditions are there without having to to always go out and look at things. So uh, a tiny bit of automation for, for that, but it saves a lot of staff time uh, when resources are tight. Uh, as there's less people to do those jobs, as Mark was alluding to. So looking for ways to, to do those types of things. Yeah, the, the bike example is a really cool one. I've seen that bike. And I've also seen new sensors being added to some public vehicles that allow them to capture information while they're carrying out their other functions, which mm -hmm. is really neat. I'll also have my families on those trails every single day. So we certainly appreciate uh, you keeping them up to, up to par for us. I will change gears just a little bit here. We're gonna talk a little bit about diversity, equity, and inclusion, something that uh, we are seeing talked about everywhere in every industry. But you know, these, if we think of infrastructure construction, on this isn't the industry we often associate diversity, equity, inclusion with right at the front, but it is being incorporated in just about everything we do. So what are some of the ways that uh, people like yourselves or others can ensure that DEI is being incorporated 
whether on the, you know, the actual project itself or as it looks to reaching out to certain workforces to make sure the projects can be more equitable and inclusive. Right, Mark, we can start with you. Sure. Um, you know, so if you look at things in the bill, one of the emphasis points has been to make sure that there is more equitable um, just access to resources uh, for, for people's transportation and mobility needs, uh, economic development purposes, uh, but also that we make sure that there, those benefits and those costs are distributed fairly and um, really appropriately across the communities. Because there's a lot of communities over the last 50, 60 years through federal transportation policy that have been underserved. And I think there's been a real point of emphasis, especially with the Justice 40 program, which wants to channel 40% of these dollars into populations that have been historically underserved, uh, especially for transportation and mobility. So the, the equity is really a point of emphasis. And I think you know, some of the things that we can be doing, both as individuals and organizations, are really to focus on a handful of things. One, make sure you're engaging your communities at, at every opportunity of the project development cycle. Uh, making sure that you're being, and this is a word that comes up again, innovative, right? How you reach out to those populations, how you reach out to those communities to assess their needs and what the benefits might be from infrastructure investment is important. You have to respect and understand those community needs as well. That will help you then focus the investments that need to be made with those populations. And if you start to do that, you also want to assess how you're doing it. Is it effective? Even look internally to your organizations. Are we creating barriers on how we procure materials, how we contract with vendors, how we hire staff, right? Making sure you're looking through that equity lens to broaden that, because in the long term, it'll help address that talent shortage as well, because you're broadening that pool of talent that you're looking for. So if you start to do those things and you think about it and you incorporate it into just how you do your project development process, then I think over time, the goals of the, of the bill are gonna be met. And we're going to see real investments in some underserved communities, and the, all of our communities will benefit from you know this infrastructure investment program. Yeah, yeah and I think you're you're starting to see that overlay. I, you know, I was pleased to see it just be, you know deeply embedded in the meat of the bill. I mean, it was obviously a priority. You know, how you think about it as those dollars are spent. Not only is there the engagement, which is critical, but looking at the, the specific piece that you're doing well, how does it impact it you know i mean people forget you know if you look at how 235 dropped in here we have a local example just right up here that had we thought and if you look at communities across the country a lot of times that physical infrastructure intentionally or not a lot of times intentionally created this barrier so i think to see that in there and that thought process of how that does that you know um, you know, two local examples, if you have been a part of the Deploying Forward plan, the intentionality behind that, the groups that were engaged, the amount of nonprofit engagement there that would never have typically, you know, when we're talking about doing stuff downtown, we would not have reached out. And I think you're starting to see that you're starting to ask those, again, people that have not typically been at the table asking their input. So I think it's very interesting to see here, you know, trails is a great example. We do a ton of that work. Um, but starting to think about, you know, how many trails are coming from the near north side into downtown? How many of those have we put in? Are we focusing on that, using it as a form of transportation? Um, and so I think you'll start to see a lot of those really good conversations as a part of that in being embedded in this bill. So, Todd, I'll turn to you now. Yeah, thanks. Um, I agree with what's been said, but one of the things we do at the MPO is uh, part of our planning process, and we've been doing this for a few years now, is uh, looking at what we've termed degrees of disadvantage, whether that's age, um, a single household income, a housing status are some of the criteria, and overlaying those, those criteria against the transportation uh, spending of, of um, funding that we receive. And are we spending as much in, in the disadvantaged areas as we are in, in other areas um, and kind of doing that analysis? Uh, are we making enough uh, improvements, uh, gains in, in those disadvantaged areas compared to, to other areas of the Metro and really doing an analysis on where we're spending those dollars and where we're getting uh, the bang for the buck and, and helping the most people that really need the most help. Um, so that's one of the areas uh, we're, 
we're emphasizing in, in the bill, uh, as Chris mentioned, uh, has that sort of embedded in it, uh, keeping that type of analysis going and, 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 and other programs that relate to, to equity and diversity. Yeah, exactly right. Todd, I'm gonna stick with you for our last pre-written question here. And we'll start with you uh, because I know that you have uh, communities that are members of the APO. By your very nature, you're out working with communities uh, quite frequently and hearing from them. And I also know you're out in DC just talking about funding opportunities and other things just a few weeks ago. With the large amount of funding that is flowing into our communities, and, and for this, we could look at certainly the current bill, but we've also got some other funding stream with the American Rescue Plan that continue to come in, along with the deadlines that are in place for some of those funds. What impact will we experience because of the challenges that we have discussed here today? Well, I, I think some of it's just the timing. Uh, you know, there, yeah, there is a lot of funding coming in and finding uh, enough people to to do the the work, whether that's the planning, the engineering, um, or or constructing within those timelines. Um, you know, the federal funding requires a local match, uh, so uh, especially for our smaller communities, uh, getting a little uh, innovative, creative with them on how they can come up with a local match. Typically, it's eighty federal, twenty uh, local. Uh, and sometimes they, they don't have, have that uh, money. Uh, the DOT had a program in the past few years where, where they would swap um, the federal aid funding for uh, state funding. So it uh, eliminated some of those federal requirements and, and uh, provided a benefit to the local communities. But with all this influx in, in federal funds, uh, the DOT couldn't maintain that program. So now uh, cities and counties had to go back to, to doing those programs under the federal aid where they had to bring the, the 8020 and the federal requirements on, on different parts of uh, the environmental process, as well as uh, now the, the funding isn't available for like in, the engineering as it was previously under the SWAP program. So figuring out those pieces uh, and how they impact the communities is uh, we're kind of an ongoing process, and, and uh, we're working through that with, with those communities. Chris, we can go to you next. Yeah, I think, you know, it, it's, it, it's, a, it's been a nice benefit. I think it, you just have to understand the realities. You know, we're some ARPA money. We, we have a, an affordable housing project we're working on in Grinnell. And, you know, I mean, so we were fortunate, you know, every state got those ARPA funds, and, and the state chose, you know, Governor aside a piece to apply to housing. Well, that's great, except, you know, at the point that you did that, there were virtually no rules. And so in fairness to the state agencies who are attempting to put them out to work, um, they kind of have to wait for rules. Well, at that point, you know, we're still sitting here. Well, okay, we'll get you the rules. We'll get you the rules. Well, so, okay, we got you the rules. Now tell us how much you need, and you're going to build this in two years. And I tell people, oh, let's like nail and jello, you know, because my bids are basically for th ready for three hours, and then they expire. And, you know, God bless the people at Ivor, like, well, we need full bits backed up. And I'm like, um, really? Uh, so, you know, they're trying to, in fairness to them, I'm like, again, this is how we've always done it. This is how you should be able to do it. So, that, you know, you have to give them their money. They have to go through their process, do the contracting, go out, start the project, you know. So they're, everybody's, I think, attempting to do it. But the reality is that predictability is still not there. And so it's good that it's there, but again, we have to be collaborative. Um, you know, I have to give kudos to the, the staff, you know, Debbie Durham and her staff have been very good to sit down with us, understand the realities of what we're doing, accommodating us to the quickly, you know, the path that they can. Um, but it, it's just hard. You know, I mean, the ARPA money is a great example. Again, this little Grinnell project that we have, well, the ARPA money is taxable. Okay, I'm sorry. It's coming from the federal government. So at the end of the day, you're like, I'm giving you a buck, but I need to send 25 cents back. Okay, well then, okay, so then I'm doing the math. I need to increase by that so that, you know, and so fortunately there is a bill coming through that similar to the PPP will address that. But you kind of go, okay, in the bigger scope, you know, I now have to bid it at this bigger number because it is a taxable piece. So a piece of the housing money that you sent to save the housing that didn't work, y'all want back. So I'm like, I think that'll work, but unfortunately by the time that works through the House and Senate, that's gonna be 18 months down the road and I'll be three quarters of the way through. And then again, my four folks, staff folks at IFA are like, I'm like, just go, we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. But it's those kind of, I think, unintended consequences. A, it's great the money's here, but when it filters,
down to the real level, those are the kind of realities that you just got to deal with. We'll yeah. figure it out. An we had the law guidance, my personal favorite, the interim final rule, which we operated <laughs> under, and then we got the final rule, and, and it was a constant evolution throughout the process. I, I think there, there needs, as this starts to unfold, I think on the, on the federal government side, there's going to need to start to be some of that flexibility. As they start to see some of the issues you're talking about, that Todd has discussed, they're going to have to likewise get creative and a little bit more flexible. And I, I'll use one small example. I mean, there have, ever since they got rid of earmarks, a series of different grant opportunities to help fund projects. And, and those have been increasing over time. But I think with this program, there's something, I'll defer to you if I get the number wrong, but I think it's something in the area of $100 billion that will be available for a variety of different grants. And if you open up the file, where it lists the grants. I think it runs close to five pages long of the different types of grants. And there's a different grant coming out every week. And it's honestly, it's got a lot of our clients' heads spinning because they, they're trying to figure out their projects, which grants they qualify for. Uh, you get, you know, the notice hits Tuesday, it's due in six weeks, there's different requirements. So as we're working through this, I think there's gonna have to be some push and pull and some flexibility on the part of the, of the federal government to, as you're talking about, doing the interim rules and the final rules and everything, you know, start to refine that process and work out some of the kinks because otherwise there's going to be a lot of missed opportunities for people's projects to be able to tap into those funds and actually do and meet the intent of the program. So, yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I want to just jump up and down on you talking about basic information overload that people are receiving related to these grants. I know cities across the state are trying to get information to them in a way that they can utilize it's been incredibly difficult because we have so many different buckets for you guys. If you could just simplify the menu just a little bit, maybe get it down to two pages for the grants. Yeah. That, <laughs> but then all the information documents within those. You know, another thing, and as we look at that, um, the deluge of information coming out, I have to remind DC, we have 500 cities in the state below 500 population. And so you go up and then you got a large threshold, you know, 2000. And so there's not always the administrative capabilities right. at the lower level. So they, they do need the support. We have run through our pre-written, so I will open it up first uh, to questions within the room. And if there are none from our hundreds of people, I'm making eye contact. Yes. Um, so Chris, you've spoken a lot about how we've done things the same way for a long time, and it's uncomfortable now to have all of these changes coming at once. So what are some things or some ways you think we can make these incremental changes so that if we ever run into another um pandemic hopefully not or event like this that it won't be so painful when we get to that point i think you know a i i, I tell people like stop trying to measure this stop trying to go back and say it's this or that it's not but you still have i think it's leaning on you know what we talk about in our shop is leaning on the underpinnings of what we have built in this community understanding that we have the lifestyle pieces, the, the governance pieces, you know, leaning on that again, but stop trying to assume that moving one lever will solve all issues. And I think leaning on the expertise that you will get there. We really want, we want one problem to solve all. We want the ARPA funding to solve all. It's just not going to. And I think what this has forced everybody to do is, is exactly what we talked about, collaborate, work with, you know, I mean, I honestly went in and sat down with the people and I'm like, you guys either got to get on or I'm getting out. I'm going to call Grinnell and said, I, these can't, guys are just black and white and I, I can't, but I just said, okay, we need to figure it out. How do we sit down with you as a partner and work through these funds? Because we need the housing to occur. And so I think for us, it's for everybody, it's okay, how do we work together? How can we collaborate? Again, public private stuff, um, you know, how can we make that stuff work and stop trying to assume that we can be black? I mean, the collaboration is exactly the federal government, you know, in place by 24, everything done at 26. That's not gonna happen. And so we, I think, have to realize that. This is this one's unique in the fact that it literally impacted the planet. Like, take me back through history and give me the example of a singular thing that impacted the entire planet. It hasn't. But I'm with you. 
it's coming again. And so to assume this is never going to happen, I mean, I'm working with a consultant, we're doing a, a housing project, and he's like, how are you planning for the next pandemic? And I literally, my heart stopped because I'm thinking, I would just like to close the door on the current one. <laughs> But it's a reality, and that's what he said is, what have we learned exactly what you're saying? We will have another impact where we will be in a lockdown situation. How do we create those now? He's like, how have you created a space in this property knowing you're going to be in lockdown? How have you created a touchless, the way to go through touchless? So it's that kind of thing, I think, A, that it will be bumpy, we can collaborate, but how are we planning for the next pandemic? Because now that we realize we are so, so more connected. Again, if you think about where this came and boom across the entire planet, that's like, oh, and it will occur again. So I hope that that's what we take back is how do we think about that? But I also think we responded so quickly. I mean, I think just the amount of, I'm not trying to get off my podium, but the, the response from the federal government, you know, you can argue too much to the, the, the fact that we've learned and they came so quickly. I don't know that we understand the depth of how great that was. Now you can argue timing and amount, but the fact that we learned from the prior recession, they came immediately. I think that that's positive. And so I think hopefully we stop and do exactly what you're saying. Think about what are those pieces we can carry forward how can we work together? How can we say this infrastructure needs to happen? I probably can't get it out as fast as you like, but don't kill it just because it can't go out in a day. Exactly. Keep your eye on the target. What's the intent behind it? How are we working together to get there? That's right. the important piece. Right. Because you'd love to have 12 centers. Yeah. The fact that you got one right now is like, whoo, I got somebody. <laughs> That's just maybe the reality too. But let's not not do the road because there's just one guy that can do it. Okay, but again, federal requirements. Oh, yeah. I've got five. <laughs> I can find five. <laughs> we had to adapt and, and learn so quickly that I don't know we've had a chance to look back and say, what did we learn? But we're still adapting today uh, and moving forward. You know, the pandemic's still with us, and certainly the impacts of it are still there. Any additional questions from our audience here? Just have a few minutes. Ryan, any questions from the internet? No. <laughs> Perfect. Well, I want to just turn it over. Final thoughts. We've talked about a lot today. We've talked about workforce, supply chain management, evolution of the industry. What are some final thoughts? And Mark, we can start with you and, and go around. Building on what Chris and I were just talking about for your last question, let's make sure we're keeping an eye on what's important that the intent of the program is to help our communities be better places to live and work. How are we contributing to that? What can we be doing to cut through the noise, to cut through the BS, to cut through the red tape, work together, collaborate and innovate so that we can make this work better so that it starts to show success. Because the reality is, is if we don't start showing success stories, the, the, the pressure, the impetus for continued funding is going to peter out and it's going to be something else that's shiny and new. And if we lose this opportunity, it'll be a shame. Yeah. I agree. I was, I was talking with a government official this week on just, you know, the, the noise that's going on and the, the emotional reaction to that. And we had a specific headline that we didn't care for because I clickbait was the word I used. But, you know, he's like, but, you know, if we just, if we wrote the headline that said relax, everything will be okay, no one would read it. And I literally, I'm like, I am so attached to that statement that he made because I'm like, that's what it is today. Like, there is so much noise right now. And if you, like, step back, all those underpinning things are fine. We'll make it. It'll be okay. But we're so caught up in the noise right now that you know i'm like yes they move 75 but in fairness we all knew that like right okay breathe um but you know we spent a lot of time in our you know company talking with our employees what does that really mean to this industry what does that mean to your job what does that mean for the community and so i think if we can all again understand what those specific things mean 
peel back the noise a little bit. Again, infrastructure, this is fantastic for the, this, the you know, all of the US, but specifically for Iowa, our community, you will get some things there. Water trails is a great example that are long-term plays for us. And so if you can peel back the noise, you know, yes, we would have loved Scott Street to go immediately. We'll peel it back and figure it out, you know? And as he said, we're going to use everything on the other side. Todd, love your comments. Uh, thanks. And I agree with uh, the things that Mark and Chris had said, but it is just uh, having that flexibility uh, as we go through these programs and not getting too bogged down into the minutia um, that sometimes the Fed regs get, get into, uh, having that flexibility and, and, and hit those, what the real intent of the programs are and, and figure out those pieces and, and we'll be okay and, and just keep moving forward. Fantastic. We've talked about a lot today. A couple of words that stuck in my four words that stuck in my mind: collaboration, flexibility, innovation, and creativity. And then a theme which I really like coming out of here is eyes on the prize. Right? We've got to keep our eyes on the mission, what you're trying to achieve. There's a lot of noise, a lot of difficulties, but if you just keep your eyes on what that goal is, then then that's the direction you're going to head. I will turn it if there's any additional questions that came in off the internet. No? Otherwise, I'll just uh, say thank you so much for your, your time and expertise and an applause while I turn it back over to Ryan here. All right. Thank, thank you, Robert, and, and thank you uh, to our, our panel. I, I told you guys today we brought in some experts and they definitely crushed it. I did write some questions I was going to ask you, but you guys covered all them. So you guys are you guys are prepared. So I and the prize is exactly right. Uh, again, thank you everyone who attended in person and those who attended online. Uh, our, our next panel is August 18th, which will focus on cybersecurity. Again, another important topic that we are facing uh, in, in the policy realm. So I sent the registration link online. If you haven't already, please go to our events page and sign up. And also during in those pages, you can sign up for our weekly e-newsletter where we do cover policy topics from federal, state, and, and local. And lastly, please subscribe and listen to our podcast where we do also take a little bit deeper dive in some of these important policy topics. Okay. So with that, thank you everyone, and we'll see you in August. <laughs>